it's just wonderful to see so many old friends here. It's just fantastic. To... All right, folks. I would, it's my, my distinct honor to introduce the moderator of our next panel, U.S.-China Outlook 2024. The moderator is the Financial Times U.S.-China correspondent, Dmitry Sevastopolo, a veteran journalist, a guest formerly on the Seneca podcast, too, so make sure to check it out. Dmitry Sevastopolo will uh, come on and, and introduce to you our other esteemed panelists. So give it up for Dmitry. I'm sorry. Yes, anywhere you like. Well. Everybody good? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dimitri Sevastopoulos with the Financial Times. Uh, I'm a little bit under the weather, so apologies if I sound a little bit groggy. Uh, it's not COVID. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce our panelists. I think you all know them, so I'll keep this very short. On my far left is Ling Ling Wei from the Wall Street Journal, who when I wake up in the morning and see her byline, I panic. Um, <laughs> We have Rick Waters, uh, formerly from the State Department, uh, who was running China House and is now at Eurasia Group. Welcome, Rick. Um, we have Amy Selico from the world of consultancy and business, who is an expert on US-China business relations from uh, Stonebridge Albright. So good morning to you all, and thank you very much. Thank you. OK, we're going to jump right in. Rick, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, straight up and say the elephant not in the room today is Kurt Campbell, the White House Indo-Pacific <laughs> Coordinator, uh, who it turns out is moving to state to be Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, how consequential a move do you think that is for China policy in the US government? Uh, thanks, Dimitri. Um, it's good to be here. I, I think the Deputy Secretary position is consequential, but the, for China policy, it's, it, the direction is set, right? It's a presidential policy. The State Department plays an important role, but, but really, if you were to hive it off in terms of percentages, I would say maybe 20, 25 percent of the policy is run from state. Much of it is DOD now, technology policy, trade. So uh, Kurt will be um, consequential in those debates, but my feeling is that really, when you're in the third year of an administration, the trajectory is pretty much locked in. Just, just to quickly follow on, I mean, one of his strengths is he's very good at um, keeping allies happy, taking them out for drinks and lunches and backslapping them and taking up a lot of their time. Do you think the allies will get as much of Kurt Campbell if he's over at state, or will he be spread a little bit more across a range of portfolios? Well, I think they'll still get a lot of care and feeding because structurally his predecessor, Wendy Sherman, had been the, the key point of contact for the Koreans, the Japanese, and many others in, in the Indo-Pacific out of state. He will have a global uh, role, but one structural quirk under this administration is that Tony Blinken has broken out the management piece of that job and given it to another deputy. And that will actually give Kurt more bandwidth, I think, to focus on ally partner management. OK, so let's uh, change lanes. Um, Amy, we are expecting Xi Jinping to come to APEC in a couple of weeks. Um, can you give me a sense of what you think the Biden and Xi can realistically achieve at APEC? Well, it's great to be here, and thank you uh, very much to join this great panel. I think, you know, one of the real achievements going into this meeting that the White House, of course, confirmed yesterday that the, the two presidents will meet on the sidelines of APEC, one of the achievements probably is that expectations have been properly set uh, for not a lot of concrete <coughs> outcomes, but a lot of process. And process that is important in order for us to have this very, very difficult relationship put on not an improved course, but just a steady course. And so I think that in and of itself is important. I think that the two sides are working very hard to come up with some deliverables, some outcomes. I think He Lifeng being uh, a part of the delegation and of course meeting with uh, 
his U.S. counterpart, Secretary Yellen, will give for uh, my clients in the business community a sense of how the U.S. and China are going to think about economic issues on a broader scale, potentially Secretary Raimondo meeting with her counterpart, uh, the Commerce Minister on the commercial side. That's important. And so with expectations set so low, we do have the ability to actually celebrate the fact that the two leaders who know one another so well want to see a relationship where they both get benefit in their home jurisdiction for re-engaging and benefit from around the world, that they're managing this very contentious relationship in a responsible manner. And do you think there's anything in terms of deliverables that can come out of this that President Biden can sell to the American people as this is a victory for the U.S., or is it really just stabilizing relations is the victory? It's harder to sell the latter. Right. I don't think there are going to be so many deliverables that Americans will see and say, oh, my goodness, this is so much better. Of course, both sides will try, whether it is trying to oh, well, already what has been happening is increasing the number of flights um, going back and forth, trying to ease visa um, rules and processes, hopefully some progress on fentanyl, an issue that, of course, Americans care deeply about, but I don't think it's understood very well that China, while it has banned exporting fentanyl, it's these precursors that are going mainly to Mexico, but I think that's the kind of thing President Biden will, will point at and say, when we cooperate on issues that matter to both of our countries, that's where we actually see benefits in, in this relationship. Ling Ling, based on the many scoops you have, you clearly have some good sources in Beijing. I'm obviously not going to ask you who they are. But what do you think the Chinese side wants from this summit? Is it the same thing the Americans want, or is it different? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the invite. It's uh, quite an honor to be on this panel. Um, in terms of my sources, they're classified. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, in terms of what the Chinese want to achieve, I, I completely agree with Amy. The very fact that both leaders are meeting is a win uh, for both countries and for the rest of the world. This very likely will be the last meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping uh, ahead of uh, you know the end of next year, in a year, right? So in January, the Taiwan election coming up, uh, the presidential election year next year. Uh, so it's crucial meeting. For the Chinese, I think nothing matters more to them than Taiwan. Uh, they would want a very firm um, you know, commitment uh, still from the US side, who recognizes very well uh, that you know, the US still committed to the one China policy, doesn't support Taiwan independence. So I think that's really the core, the core uh, in terms of Chinese asks. The economic issues uh, be super interesting to see. I'm, sh I'm sure a business community hugely uh, interested in that. But I'm not sure that's a top agenda for the Chinese side. APAC is not for trade and economic issues. Um, you know, uh, as Rick said, the China policy in the US is a presidential policy. It's already been set. The US policy in China is also a top leadership policy. It's already been said. The room for maneuvering is very, very limited. To the extent both sides can agree, OK, we, we, we just you know, have those processes in place so we can go along as competitors to make sure you know, we don't um, uh, go into outright gunfight. I think that's a huge win for, 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 for the whole world. Rick, I mean, you were, you were in government for most of the, the period that we're talking about. Can you give us just a brief kind of description of the arc of how the U.S. has approached China from, you know, Alaska through to today? And, you know, a couple of years ago, I would hear officials sometimes be a little bit, you know, slightly optimistic that they might be able to get Xi Jinping to change course in a few small areas. I don't really hear that anymore. So I'm curious, do you think, is the U.S. government overall more pessimistic about the ability to to change uh, or to convince Xi Jinping to change course anywhere? Well, I think the arc of the Biden-Harris administration China strategy really is built on three pieces. One is the reinvestment domestically. The second was the stabilization and strengthening of ally partner relationships. 
And then third, to your point, Dimitri, I think the approach towards China has evolved from one in which the bilateral engagements were meant to you know, activate reformist nodes or something like that into a, an approach where basically the bilateral goals are more modest. They focus more on making sure that each side understands the other's intentions. But really, I think the, the China strategy's central premise is that second piece. It's using the ally partner um, ad hoc issue-specific coalitions to change the cost calculus that China faces on any given issue, um, and ideally in areas where interests align, cooperate. But, but I think it's really um, that central premise which answers your question of how the administration views Xi. His line is set, his views are very firm, and at this point, really, the, the best, most realistic approach is to change the costs of the policies that are most antithetical to U.S. interests. And would you, would you say the administration has been successful in doing that? I mean, can you point to areas where, because of the Biden administration and the allies did X, China may have refrained from doing Y, or, or is it too early to see those kind of results? Well, I think the best example of this is uh, with regard to Ukraine. So we all remember the joint statement that Xi and Putin did on the eve of the Ukraine war. And the signal that that statement sent to the Chinese system was basically help Putin. And then a combination of US and U European diplomacy to inject red lines after the, the war broke out, red lines specific to lethal support or significant sanctions evasion I think it was that, that uh, shaping effort, together with Brussels, that froze the instructions in the Chinese system. And to this day, we haven't seen evidence of significant lethal or sanctions evasion support to Moscow. A lot of other stuff is going on. But I think it's a good example of how you can still affect the calculations in Beijing, even if you're not solving the actual disagreement. So can I ask all three of you, do you think, I mean, have we arrived at a point in the relationship for the foreseeable future where it's really not going to be possible to uh, generate big, meaningful deliverables and that essentially what's happening now is, certainly on the US side, it's an effort to manage risk and prevent conflict between the two most important countries in the world? Amy, would you like to? Uh, yes, I think we have arrived at that place and I don't think it's going to change in 2024 or beyond that for, for a time. Uh, and so what that means to the stakeholders who care about the relationship all around the world is they have to see whether and how um, smaller steps can help to actually affect change that impacts Middle East policy or global M&A transactions that require China's uh, approval. Just we can get really targeted on issues, whether they're big or they're, or they're small, where even in the absence of a relationship that's founded on constructive engagement and lots of exchange, I do think there is still space. Uh, and some of that space is created by China's economic situation. I think that's probably not at, at all something <laughs> I want to celebrate, but I do think it's also helping the Chinese government think about the role of foreign investors and the role of Chinese partnership uh, outside of China differently uh, because it's, a, its economy right now is in a different place and is going to continue to be facing challenges for the foreseeable future. So I think that does change things even in the absence of a relationship that's stable with the United States and built on a lot of exchange and positives. Uh, could you expand a little bit and give us a sense of what you think the, you know, the weakening of the Chinese economy, and people will debate how weak it is, but it's certainly weakened. Where are they likely to adjust policy and maybe be more accommodating to the US or, or less restrictive because of that? Well, I think there's a real disconnect right now between um, how policymakers are talking about the state of the Chinese economy and, and continued need to have foreign investors in the market contributing to China's uh, economic development 
and actual policy making. As we all know, of course, this overlay of national security on so many commercial policies in China has inhibited foreign investors and Chinese companies across a whole wide range. But I do think this is where uh, you know, China has been talking about uh, reinvesting in the value of foreign investment in the market. And now we're waiting to see, are they going to take concrete steps to make it easy? As, uh, as you know, the CAC um, releasing a uh, call for comments on draft rules that would change the data, cross-border data flow rules. That is a concrete example of a policy that was going to inhibit the ability of so many companies operating in China. And so now we're going to see, did China mean it? Are they going to take comments? Are they going to really adjust uh, that data law? Or are they just going to try to have it both ways? Talk about attracting investment more, but not making changes. Good. Thank you. Ling Ling, we talked about personnel shifts in the US government with Kurt Campbell, uh, and there have been some others in Asia policy recently as well. China's had its own kind of personnel shifts. Um, uh, Qing Gang has uh, taken extended leave. Uh, Li Shang Fu is also in Hainan enjoying time on the beach. Um, what do you think is happening in Beijing right now, and does it have any impact on U.S.-China relations, or is it a separate domestic issue that is really irrelevant from Washington's perspective? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Um, I think the impact on China's uh, foreign policy is very, very limited uh, because you know neither Li Shangfu or Qing Gang actually had any big role in setting the policies. They you know, at most, they were implementers. Uh, but obviously, there are some practical reasons why we were worried, you know, when they abruptly uh, moved out. Uh, because, you know, how many uh, US uh, CEOs have said, oh, I spent so much time cultivating relations with Qing Gang, and now that all went to waste. And also, um, it doesn't look good for China. Uh, Xi Jinping has always prided um, you know, take, taken pride in the Chinese system being so stable and predictable. Look what happened, you know, as soon as, you know, right after he secured this unprecedented third term, basically ran the table, he immediately purged two of the top officials he picked himself. I think the deeper reason, I'm not seeing any signs of political upheaval or rebellion you know, in the system, but I think the deeper reason why he's doing this is for security reasons. Uh, we have reported that uh, the chief reason for Qing Gang's removal uh, was a fair, alleged affair uh, that took place in the United States. Imagine, you know, when I talk to the Chinese contacts, they said, imagine the CIA would have a pile on him. Could be easily blackmailed, right? Or MI6, whatever, right? Uh, so uh, in the case of Li Shangfu, again, Li Shangfu is the international face for the Chinese military, right? He uh, uh, engages, uh, engaged with uh, foreign counterparts, uh, military diplomacy. Um, an another sensitive uh, uh, area. His um, removal, um, it looked like, had something to do with corruption in the military. But why not earlier? Why now? It's again this renewed, uh, much stepped up emphasis by Xi Jinping on national security, uh, rooting out anything that he felt like you know could destabilize that. Uh, that's why we're seeing it happening now. And for the military, it's really not just Li Shangfu, right? There are quite a few, I mean, dozens of others. The names we don't even know. Why? Because he really wants to ensure Chinese military's capacity to fight. Not that we're saying a war is imminent, but if it happens, he wants to make sure China wins. Ling Ling, can I also ask you about Taiwan? You said that's going to be the top priority for Xi Jinping and the Chinese at APEC. Um, I'd like to ask all of you, but start with you, Ling Ling. Do you think, is there any way that the US and, and uh, China can reach some kind of a compromise on Taiwan, something that will make both sides reassured, the Chinese more reassured that the US is not encouraging independence, et cetera, and the US uh, more reassured that you know, Chinese military activity around Taiwan is not going to lead to actual military action at some point? 
or are they so far apart on Taiwan that it's just not conceivable? Um, I'm sure Rick is a mad, much better person to answer this question than I am. Uh, just you know, very briefly, I think um, you know for the Chinese, I, I think they're at this moment. The, both governments are not that far apart on Taiwan. I don't think the U.S. is actively supporting independence whatsoever. Uh, the goal remains to be deterrence, deterring China from taking military actions. And, and, and um, you know, from uh, Chinese action, despite the fact that they increase military exercises across Taiwan Strait, you know, they're not ready, you know, to take that kind of risk. So, you know, I'm not seeing too two sides being too far apart, but I'll, I'll leave uh, that to Rick. Rick. Well, I think in the short term, I would agree. I think that the Chinese are distracted domestically. The, the US, for its own reasons, wants stability distracted by two ongoing wars. And so on Taiwan, I think you're already seeing the typical pattern of US engagement in an election, which is trying to find a balance between an absolutist prohibition on weighing in on the election itself and a clear reaffirmation that U.S. policy has certain bounds. And I think we saw that when Laura Rosenberger, who heads the American Institute in Taipei, was out a few weeks ago. She reaffirmed that the U.S. does not support Taiwan independence. And that's a signal to the candidates that, you know, whoever wins, wins. But if you want to have a productive relationship with Washington, those are the long-standing rules. I think from my sense of uh, Beijing's position, there's a debate underway about whether they can find a coexistence formula with a William Lai government. And I think that that is a very important debate to watch because if they convince themselves there's no alternative but to resort to coercion, it, it could be very unsettling next year to watch as pressure on a new Taiwan administration puts a new president, whoever it is, in a situation where they will then have to respond politically. And I think that runs the risk of getting tied up in US electoral politics and dynamics under a new Speaker of the House that, that you know could in a way be destabilizing even if the two leaders don't want that outcome from San Francisco. And do you think how this might be a kind of naive question, but how concerned is the U.S. government writ large or Washington with the Taiwanese election? So, for example, William Lai has been telling people recently that he will follow the policies of uh, Tsai Ing-wen, but everyone who knows him says he has a very different temperament from her. She's been magisterial in navigating some of the difficult issues with a very even keel, um, and it's unclear as to whether he will have the same temperament in, in difficult moments. So are people concerned, not just about him? I mean, is it a, something people are really worried about or not? And I think there's, there's, a, there's no reason to believe that William Lai is going to pursue de jure independence on the back end of this election. I mean, if you look at his statements carefully, he's generally reaffirming size for four-pillar cross-strait policy. And I think that's probably a reflection of continuity within the DPP on these issues. Um, you know, he, like any politician, meets with his constituents and, you know, isn't always perfectly on message. But I think the worries in Washington are more about the medium to long-term direction of China's cross-strait policies. Not, not that there's some invasion timeline, but what will it mean if the signals from Beijing are of one of discontent with the status quo, capabilities are increasing, and perhaps domestic legitimacy is not as strong as it was when the economy was uh, growing at five to six percent GDP uh, annual growth rates. Amy, do you think on, on Taiwan, is there any room for improvement? I have to say, I really worry about this issue because I, I think it really just is such a clear example of this you know, just vast deficit of trust between the two sides. And so that leads to this classic security dilemma where one side takes actions to reinforce how it views the situation that undermines the other side. And so they take actions that continue to, you know, um, 
gin us all up, wind us up, rather than reinforce. So I agree with what you both have said, that both sides don't want a crisis over Taiwan. But I really do think, and Rick, you just said this, when, when both sides look, look at the other, they see medium-term intention to change policy on Taiwan. And I think that is a fundamentally difficult thing to overcome when it's reinforced in both capital um, by stakeholders in, in each government. And so we can say whatever we want, we being people in Beijing, Washington, and Taipei, but I, I do think minds are made up in a very difficult way on this issue. And every side of that triangle can point to actions by uh, another side of the triangle that are undermining the security and the status quo. And I think that will be a difficult dynamic to turn off. Of course, it's what we need, but it's going to be very difficult. And uh, do you think minds are so set that, I mean, is it possible that Joe Biden, when he sits down with Xi Jinping, can say something that will cause Xi Jinping to say, OK, I'm a little bit more relaxed about this now, or is that just pie in the sky? I, I hope and I expect he is going to say, we are not changing our policy on Taiwan. He um, is clearly trying to be more disciplined in how he talks about that issue um, because misstatements, you know, once, twice, three times says, hey, this is what somebody believes. And so that's um, unfortunate, but I, I do think it reinforces what I'm saying, and that is just this fundamental view that, okay, you're telling me what I want to hear right now, but I, that's not changing my calculus on how we deal with the security issue. And, and that will be difficult for both sides to overcome, but I fully agree. I think uh, Washington understands this is the most important issue to the Chinese government. President Biden is going to show up uh, reinforcing um, that our policies aren't changing. So just piggybacking on that, Rick, let's assume hypothetically that you were in the State Department running China House and advising the president on China, hypothetically. This sounds like a trap. And uh, <laughs> it might be a small trap. And, and you're sitting down to brief the president on the APEC summit, and you say to the Mr. President, uh, Xi Jinping is going to say to you, American policy is supposedly one China policy. Um, you have, while it's not written down on paper, a policy of strategic ambiguity. Yet, Mr. Biden, four times, including in Tokyo, you said you would uh, send the U.S. military to defend Taiwan if need be. Please explain the inconsistency there. As, as a top advisor to the president, hypothetically, what would you say? It's a trap. <laughs> I'm, I'm told this is a trap. I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> No, I think, I think the, the uh, look, on the issue of strategic ambiguity, first, the, the entirety of Chinese military planning in the cross-strait context assumes the U.S. will get involved. And so I, I think the starting point for this discussion should be that the debates in Washington about strategic ambiguity, I think, are more about the, the branding of a policy that satisfies no one. Maybe it should be called smart deterrence or something like that. Because in its essence, there's no need to be more clear about U.S. intentions if the intended target doesn't have any doubt. I think the, the challenge for the president going into the meetings in San Francisco is going to be that if you look carefully at what the Chinese say about Biden and about his Taiwan policy, they don't doubt his intentions. They doubt his ability to affect them on Congress or on his own party, or to make them transferable to whatever happens in November of 2024. So you look at the Xinhua statements, and there's always this reference to what they call whole process management, which I think loosely translates to you Americans get your you-know-what together, get your discipline commission to go knock some heads, and get everyone in line. And I think that may be euphemistic also for you, you also stay on message. But I don't think that um, that, is, that is the depth of the mistrust and misunderstanding on the Taiwan issue. I think, to be honest, the issue of how each side views its intentions will not be resolved by assurances in private meetings at this point. It is too well entrenched and, and, and too reflective of the reality that Xi Jinping's internal speeches and everything that he has signaled about his 
aspirations on that issue are things we have to take seriously, and they don't imply he's content with the status quo. So how does the U.S. boost deterrence or smart deterrence for Taiwan in a way that doesn't convey to Xi Jinping or that doesn't have him take the message as you're emboldening Taiwan and therefore I should actually accelerate whatever plan I may have in my mind? How do you thread that needle? Well, I mean, I think the way you do it is, is in some ways the way the administration has been doing it. The, the existing framework of the U.S. one-China policy rests in part on the Taiwan Relations Act, which has very clear language about U.S. defense sales, as did the Reagan-era assurances on this point. So uh, building the hard aspects of deterrence, both in terms of Taiwan's asymmetric defenses, its ability to harden its society through mobilization mechanisms, and then the, the broader extended deterrence that the U.S. is, is strengthening in the Indo-Pacific region that's not just about the Taiwan issue but not irrelevant to it. I think that's one piece. A second piece of it is building international awareness about the, the value that Taiwan brings and the risks that I think all countries share of instability in the cross-strait context. And you're seeing that through G7 statements. You're seeing it more and more the case that countries will speak out about their interest in peace and stability. And I think the diplomatic deterrence, the military deterrence, and then the reassurances in private channels, those are the three key pieces of a, an overall deterrence framework. Uh, Ling Ling, I want to ask you a little bit about US-China tech competition um, and you know, economic security and national security. So I went with Janet Yellen to Beijing, and we were allowed into the first five minutes of her meeting with Holi Feng. And I had my camera, and I, I photographed Holly Fung's face through the whole time to see how it would change. And most of the introductory remarks were very positive. We want to do things together, global macro stability, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end, she said, but of course, we will take national security measures when we have to. And his, his face muscles kind of tightened a little bit. Um, so my question is, is it possible to cordon off the tech competition um, in a way that it doesn't affect the broader relationship? Or is it such an important thing that from China's perspective, you can't really put it in a separate bucket and pretend like it doesn't exist? Um, I think it's pretty much impossible. And um, you know, to begin with, the Chinese are not so good about compartmentalization to begin with. Um, you know, they think, um, everything should be related, right? Um, we cooperate um, on some, you know, Taiwan, uh, uh, on, on tech, then, you know, you, you guys should lay off on something else. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, the tech competition right now is really at the core of the US-China competition. And one of the key drivers that have brought Xi Jinping to the table for this meeting with uh, President Biden is uh, a desire to slow down the pace of US tech sanctions. So, you know, it, as, as we have seen um, just most recent week, right? Uh, US tightened uh, export controls yet again aimed at China, uh, small yard, high fence, that, right? This regime, Xiao Yuan Gao Qiang, you know, that's the Chinese translation. Um, you know, they're, they're call, the Chinese side calling that BS, right? 什么小院高墙, it's, it's, it's an expanding yard, um, <laughs> bigger and a big bigger. So they have retaliated every time U.S. did something. And this is not going to go away. Their strategy, I think, you know, talking is good, but nothing much has really changed. And they'll continue to try to um, get the U.S. to slow down the pace of sanction, uh, sanctions. You know, most recently, the Chinese side really has played hard to get, right? Xi Jinping had, has had this desire to come, but they want to make sure that the U.S. Uh, didn't take that for granted, and they tried to leverage that, the U.S. Biden's desire for Xi to come to try to extract concessions from the U.S., but so far, you know, it's, it's status quo. Nothing really is moving. 
So Amy, when the business community looks at all of this, the tech competition, small yard, high fence, um, and again, questions about how small the yard really is, um, and outbound investment rules that Treasury is drawing up right now, what is the impact on, on US-China relations overall of all of these things? I mean, how do you see it playing out over the next few years? For companies who, for the who, yeah, who for companies, want to be yeah. operating in China? I think, you know, governments talk about de-risking, but co every company that I'm working with seems to be instituting some kind of de-risking strategy. It doesn't mean leaving the China market. Most of the clients I'm working with, and of course I'm working with clients who want to be in China, are trying to figure out a way to uh, reinforce stability in their business operations. Sometimes that includes redundancies or extra localization within China or diversification um, because of the lessons that companies have learned. The ability of Beijing and Washington to, to take policy actions that impede companies' continued uh, activities in China is more significant now than ever, and the uncertainty around this is higher. And so that risk calculus that every company has to take is very difficult and then reinforced by the state of the Chinese economy. And so um, for um, the business community, and of course there was a small meeting of, of companies, even meeting with the foreign minister when he was in Washington, um, thanks to the Chinese embassy organizing that last weekend. And you know, each one had something to say about US-China relations adversely impacting commercial ties to China and politicizing um, trade and investment flows. This is a new reality. I don't think any company thinks, oh, maybe it'll change in 2024, 2026. And so they're planning around it. We spend a lot of time <coughs> doing exercises with clients to see exactly how do they double down in the China market to reduce the vulnerability um, of tariffs or of export controls or investment restrictions, or how do they build in redundancies to supply chains because of the concern that Washington or Beijing will continue to restrict um, trade and investment flows. So that's the reality that companies are dealing with. I think in going into 2024, having lived through the experience of having to uh, de-risk their Russia strategies because of the war in Ukraine, uh, companies are looking at what does this mean for us in China, the risk of sanctions either from Washington or Beijing, the risk of some kind of military accident or incident spiraling out of control and impacting trade and investment flows, and then the almost assurance that Washington and Beijing are going to continue to restrict this part of the, of the bilateral relationship means they have to be prepared, means they have to see the second largest economy in the world in a different way than they have. And I, and I think that's really taken the business community a long time to settle into this realization that how you were able to operate in China for the past 15 years really is not an indication of how you will be able to operate going forward. And so just thinking very tactically about what that means for each uh, company is something that's been fascinating to watch because companies really are resilient. And so they are, they're seeing the liabilities of these enhanced restrictions on the trade and economic relationship, not through rose-colored glasses that they're going to go away, but just how do we have to deal with it? So, so just to expand on that, to what extent are they basically reacting to the current policies and adjusting whatever they need to do? And to what extent are they looking forward and saying, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it looks likely that whether it's President Biden 2.0 or, or Donald Trump 2.0, that things are going to get tougher, and therefore we actually have to be more aggressive in, in our de-risking than the law or regulations currently require. More aggressive in either your de-risking or your localization. I was just speaking with a client last night in Beijing who was talking about the view in Beijing and this, this real sense of pessimism 
in U.S.-China relations going forward. And so this individual working for an American company saying, should we step up our local acquisitions so that hopefully they can get through before the relationship does continue just to be more difficult overall and so have an impact on us? And I think that's, you know, the way that companies are, are looking at U.S.-China relations is not saying, all right, we just have to get through a time. They don't understand what Biden 2.0 or Trump 2.0 will mean for them. What they do know is this level of uncertainty isn't going to go away. And then again, adding on top of that, the, the dramatic change in the way they look at the Chinese economy itself. And so that is forcing companies to think differently about the second largest economy in the world, one that will remain very important, but just not in the same way uh, it, as it has been. Well, we're getting into the final furlong. We have four minutes left. Um, I want to ask you about 2024, a little bit about Donald Trump. Ling Ling, I was talking to someone in the PLA recently, and they said, we really hope Donald Trump wins. <laughs> And I said, is that because you think he doesn't give a shit about Taiwan? And he said, yes. <laughs> so my question to you is, do you think, is that a common view in Beijing? Is there a, a view on whether Trump versus Biden, who is better for China? Uh, well, um, the Biden administration has proven to be more strategic than Trump. You know, they kind of made decisions on guts, um, not really well thought out plans. So in that regard, um, they would prefer um, someone like Trump, right? And he's a you know transactional business person. Throughout the trade war, we have witnessed uh, witnessed that. And I think one key reason, a lot, I, I you know I don't have a consensus for you now, but just based on some random conversations I have had with my Chinese contacts, one big reason the Chinese, some of the Chinese prefer Trump is Trump's not very good at building up alliances with allies in Europe and in Asia. You know, in, if anything, he pushes people away, right? That would hurt the American competitiveness at the same time as we have witnessed so far this year. China has been actively trying to woo back uh, Europe. Uh, but how successful yeah. has have they been? That's another question. So I think that's a key reason. Uh, Taiwan, yeah, he, you know, he doesn't care. Uh, that's one reason, but you know, more importantly, they think the election, re-election of Trump could hurt American competitiveness. Rick, how does 2024 look to you? What impact do you think the campaign, let, let's assume it's Trump versus Biden, which is what it looks like it will probably be. How do you think that impacts US-China relations? I actually think it doesn't impact as much in 2024, at least up until November, as, as is commonly perceived. I think, to Ling Ling's point, I think there are debates in Beijing about who they would prefer. I'm not convinced um, the view on Trump is settled, because some remember that 2020 was a very different non-transactional year. Um, but I think, actually, in some ways, the risks that I worry about next year are not even about the election. It's about what Eli Ratner and uh, Admiral Aquilino were talking about a few weeks ago, this dramatic increase in unsafe military uh, intercepts of US and allied aircraft along the periphery, these are happening now at a rate of two to three a week. And as somebody who was in the US Embassy when the EP-3 and the Chinese aircraft collided in 2001, I think we have to watch stories like that that have um, low probabilities of occurring, but if they do, the escalation ladder would be very hard to manage in this environment. Amy, in the last 45 seconds, uh, just to go back to Taiwan one more time, you know, at one point, um, US admirals and generals were throwing out, you know, dates for invasion of Taiwan like there was no tomorrow. The only year we didn't have was 2026, so clearly that's the year. Um, Pentagon has told them to, to tamp it down and to stop talking about this because it's not helpful. But US companies, are they more worried about conflict over Taiwan now than they were, let's say, a year ago? Without a doubt. You know, I think superficially, that seems to be the big risk. But then when it seems like when you dig into the issues that clients in different sectors working in Chinese economy face, 
it's not just that accident um, spiraling out of control. There are also these regulatory moves and reputational risk of continuing to operate in China. And so, yes, you hear about Taiwan a lot from the business community, but then as we start to talk through issues, I think a lot of companies realize it's not just about the potential for an accident, it's also these regulatory changes that impact a global reputation that a company has to bring forward, whether it's working in China differently, the same, deeper, or not, um, for its global uh, presence. So uh, just to finish off, I want you to raise your hand if you think in five years' time uh, the U.S.-China relationship will be in a better place than it is today. If you think yes, raise your hand. <laughs> On that positive and optimistic note, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to the panelists. Uh, we could have spoken for much more, but thank you. And thank you for listening.